welcome to this uh, fall edition of the Faithful Questions. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight, even though it is only digitally. We pray tonight for all those who are fighting the fires, all who are affected by the fires. We also pray for Christian unity. Help us to be instruments of delivering your kingdom here on earth. And we ask this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, welcome to another live stream edition of Faithful Questions. I... I uh, was hoping that at the end of the summer we might be able to do something in person, but as we all know, things have not gone that way. And I must admit, there's, it feels particularly um, troublesome now that we're going back to this monthly one. I'm used to having uh, you know, 40, 60 p people here to share the topic with me, and uh, we're still in the empty room. So pretty disappointing to me, but we need to do what we need to do, and... Um, Hopefully, at some point this uh, the school year, we'll be able to go back in person. But for those of you who are not local, we will always continue to live stream. So uh, don't worry if you're thinking, oh, no, we might stop that. No, I'm going to keep doing these live streams uh, effectively indefinitely. Tonight's topic, how are Protestants different than Catholics? I have to admit, I wasn't exactly excited about doing this topic. Because it's so big and it's so fraught with problems that if you don't say things well, uh, you can you know, make uh, th misleading statements, you can offend uh, in ways that you shouldn't, um, and, and cause a lot of troubles. But it was specifically requested by two or three different people, and uh, when that's the case, I will overcome my minor objections and make sure I do it. So let's go through uh, what we'll talk about tonight. We will start with a quick history of Christianity. We're talking about the two-minute version, uh, so five seconds a century. Um, we'll talk about diversity inside Protestantism um, because that will affect everything after that. And then we'll talk, I really wanted to <laughs> use a technique I've learned in business um, it actually doesn't sound very nice, but uh, I think is a good thing. It's called the compliment sandwich, right? When you have something difficult to talk about, you start with the compliment, you say the difficult part, you end with the compliment. It's a way to uh, soften the blow of a difficult conversation. Um, so I want to, for the bulk of this, uh, I want to start with what we, we believe in common. I want to start with a positive note of how we interact with Protestants. Then I'll go through the difficult topics of everything that uh, we dif b believe differently, or at least, and we'll get into the details of the caveats. But then I will finish with speaking of how actually there are very few rules that affect how we can work with one another and the ongoing mu movement of ecumenism that's trying its best to find ways to reestablish Christian unity. All right, let's get into it. Introduction. Uh, before we get into the topic, actually, first thing we need to do is talk about how you can uh, participate in these sessions. The ideal way is to get logged in on YouTube. If you have a Gmail account, a Google account, or a specific YouTube account, you can get logged in on whatever web browser or TV you're using and, and comment through YouTube itself. And that's the best place. That's where I would like most people to go if they can. If you don't have any sort of Google account, I do have a, site, a website you can go to, deaconken.org uh, slash blog slash chat. That is a fully open chat session that anybody can use. You can use that. In either of those two locations, you are welcome to make extra comments, thoughts, whatever, um, interact with other people who might be online. So. What I want is when you specifically have a question you want asked, start your comment with all capitals, Deacon question, dash, and then in the same comment what your question is. And that way we can differentiate general chit-chat and conversation amongst the viewers from something that people actually want to ask. New one this month uh, that we're starting for the fall is actually you can text us. I've set up a virtual text number. This is not my actual phone number. 
It's uh, since this is going out to YouTube and the internet, it's a virtual number just for these sessions. Um, you can text us at 916-565-9005. 916-565-9005. Now, no reason there to do general chit chat, but if you can't get in the other ways or you're having trouble with those, you can text us and ask the question that way. Okay, so three different mechanisms, hopefully plenty of ways. All right, let's get into. So here's the short, short version of the history of all of Christianity. 2,000 years ago, Christ lived on this earth. He had 12 apostles, and he commissioned them before he died, and he sent them on their way after his death, or after his resurrection, more accurately. And these became the first bishops of the church. They're, they are the predecessors of today's bishops. And they went around the Roman Empire and started establishing Christian communities. In fact, many of the New Testament letters, right? The letter to the Corinthians or the Romans or the Thessalonians. This is letters to the Christian communities in Rome, in Corinth, in Thessalonia, uh, etc., etc. Um, so... These were the first churches, we often use the term church for a diocese, even to this day, of the church. And they were all throughout the uh, Roman Empire, particularly the ring around the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and they established these communities. These were the very first dioceses of the church. And the communities were in communion with one another because of the apostles. And after the apostles' death, their successors talk to each other, they wrote letters, they would travel, and they would keep in communion. It wasn't a perfect communion, but they would do their best to keep all of these communi uh, communities united. In fact, many times in the New Testament letters, Paul would struggle with this. He'd have to work hard to keep these communities united. And that those efforts continued after the apostles' death. There was actually a real big boon in the 4th century uh, all of a sudden, Christianity was legalized in the Roman Empire. It was no longer something you could be arrested for or, uh, at worst, killed. And this allowed the church to start getting together into councils. Uh, the very first ecumenical council is actually in the book of Acts, but the second council was the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. And this is when the church really started to formalize its teachings, uh, whether those issues of disagreement, working on pounding them out and coming to consensus, um, and the church actually was probably at its highest level of unity at this juncture. However, over the centuries, the Roman Empire started to collapse, particularly first in the West, uh, less so in the East, although it kind of just changed to a different empire. Um, and this split also caused a split in the uh, church. The, the eastern churches and the western churches a little bit were felt like they were on two different sides of a divide. They were no longer part of one united Roman Empire. They were members of separate um, empires and that has its you know, geopolitical impacts but it also would have its effect on the churches. And this strain really hurt the relationship between the eastern churches and the western churches. It took hundreds of years. There was a, it was a definitely a straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing. But in 1054, the, the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope uh, excommunicated each other, and that was the split for what we today call the Orthodox and the Catholic. By the way, just a quick aside, the terms I'm going to use are the American terms. If you go and you talk to the Orthodox in the Eastern Church, they don't call themselves Orthodox. Uh, you know, they have different names for themselves. But I'm going to use the normal terms we here in the, in the Americas use, including Orthodox in the Americas. So that was the first big split in the church. But the important thing to note here is these were all Christian communities that could trace their roots directly back to the time of Christ. The Patriarch of Constantinople, he was someone who could trace his lineage all the way back to the Apostles. Same for the Bishop of Rome, same for all the bishops of all those communities. The rise of the Muslim influence in the Middle East and its encroachment into Europe significantly affected the influence of the Orthodox Church, particularly in Europe. 
they were dealing with these very pragmatic war issues um, uh, of dealing with the, the uh, incursions of the Muslims and fighting back and things like that. So frankly, this allowed the Western church to become much more dominant. Uh, and so really, if you look at Europe after about the 11th or 12th century, the, when the last of the big uh, Muslim raids pushed the farthest in that they came, um, you really see much more about the Roman church as opposed to the Eastern church uh, in uh, the history of Europe. In the, but that didn't mean the, the Orthodox went away. They were there. They were still not happy with the Western church. There were still these disagreements that never quite got resolved. But the Western church didn't really feel the need to play ball, if you will. They were the big boys on the block. Enter the 16th century, and reformers in the Western church were not, like uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin, were not happy with uh, excesses and corruption and other problems within the church, and they fought back against those. And the result was yet another split. But the difference here is we don't have existing communities splitting. We have people leaving the Catholic communion. And so therefore it has a very different feel to it. They can't, the Bishop of Munich can't say, oh, I, I, I went with this new group. No, it would be a splinter group and the Bishop of Munich would still be the Bishop of Munich in the Roman Church. Um, and then over time, the Protestants themselves, actually right from the get-go, had three or four different factions, and those factions continued to splinter and split. So what you get is a chart that looks like this. We have early Christianity uh, to our very left. We have a couple of early, very, very small um, heretical groups that split off um, that um, actually, as you can see, a, the bulk of them came back later in around the time of the Reformation. Um, we have the big, the great schism of splitting of orthodoxy from Catholicism, and then we have the Reformation split and a whole bunch of splinters after that, uh, which are not well shown here. So that's the simple history of the groups that we have. So what do we learn from that? One, unity in the church has always been difficult. It has been a struggle from the get-go, and it is something we have had to work on. Um, and the reasons for the splits and even the moments of reconciliation are not so simple as one issue or another. They can be geopolitical. They can be a theological. They can be power struggle. They can be corruption accusations, these sorts of things. And it can be a whole big mess of all of those things or portions of each of those things mixed up together. But nevertheless, today we have three major categories of Christianity. We have the Catholics, we have the Orthodox, and we have the Protestants. Um, so, so be it. So today's talk is focused on Protestant-Catholic relations. This is not to say that Catholic-Orthodox relations are not important. There's just not a large number of Orthodox in the states. It is not the normal issue that the average Catholic is dealing with. I actually have a great deal of hope for Catholic-Orthodox relations. I'm very hopeful that in my lifetime, we might see the end of this thousand-year split. Um, I can't say for sure, but there are real reasons for hope. And I pray and I am hopeful that this reunification will happen in my lifetime, if not my children's lifetime. But nevertheless, that's not the topic for tonight. We're going to talk about the Catholic and Protestants uh, and their um, issues. Okay, so let's jump into Protestantism. The first thing to note about Protestants is we are not talking about a monolithic group. We are talking about a highly segmented group that are very different than each other. Um, we, they have uh, different um, teachings, different beliefs. Here's a quick chart that shows some of the biggest groups uh, that are not um, uh, connected to each other uh, at this point. Th there's the English schism set. This is the Angl Anglicans and their um, derivative pieces. We also have um, the Calvinist groups that split off um, that, that make a notable piece. Uh, we have the Lutherans. We have the Anabaptists. 
There are all of these different groups, and then amongst them, they split again. And they believe significantly different things. I've said in some of my talks before, I can find um, a group of every type that, uh, be- that shares a Catholic belief, and I can find a, a, a Protestant group that disagrees with the Catholic belief, with one exception, and that is, of course, the authority of the church itself. It is the only one teaching that for sure crosses all Protestant groups that they all agree on. Now, there are definitely some trends. Here is a big table that uh, I can't go through tonight. Obviously, it would take the entire time just to go through it. But that shows, and I'm sure this is very, very small on your screen, but shows a whole bunch of beliefs. And you'll notice there's three or four of them at the top that uh, are pretty universal. In fact, there's three at the top that everyone does share. But once you get below that, you have a couple of question marks. And then as we go down, we see some that significantly, uh, there's uh, most Protestants disagree with us, but there's always a couple of outliers. Uh, and then obviously at the bottom, the one issue that is across the board, every single one, is the authority of the Catholic Church and the authority of the Pope. I have some stuff here in membership and size like that. If you can pause and read it, more power to you, but uh, I'm not going to go over it. Okay, we have a question. Now, unfortunately, tonight we do not have audio from our question asker, so he's going to ask it of me. I'm going to repeat it. Go ahead, Peter. Okay, the the Coptics are, yes, they are part, the Copt, ah, thank you. I have to repeat the question. My uh, sons are reminding me. The question was, are the Coptics a uh, Orthodox church or are they yet a separate church? Uh, I believe, my understanding is they are part of the Orthodox Church. Um, uh, There are some Eastern churches that have reunified with Rome, uh, but I do not believe the Coptics are one of them. Um, So, uh, yes, I believe the Coptics who have the big church there over on uh, uh, Kirby, they are an Orthodox Church and part of the communion that exists amongst the Orthodox the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Orthodox, the Romanian Orthodox, all of them. Thank you for that question. Thank you for the reminder to actually uh, talk it through, (laughs) to repeat it. Okay. And so one thing, and I really do want to start with this. Yes, it is important to appreciate our differences, but at the same time, it is important to understand our commonality. And there are a lot of them. And if you think about it, a lot of these things are not obvious. Um, They are things that actually are theologically complicated topics. And it is uh, wonderful that we share these in common. The idea of the Trinity, that we believe in one God and three persons, and those persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Non-obvious, difficult to understand, but almost entirely across the board. And as I said, the important thing about the diversity of Protestantism, everything I say is going to have a caveat. I'm going to do my best to talk in generalities so this talk isn't four hours long, but um, just know there's always going to be a group that's an exception. I'm doing my best to generalize, and and I'll do my best to let you know when it's something that there's high diversity in the Protestant communion um, and when it's something that there's uh, more cohesion. But for most of these items, Almost entirely, if you look at almost every Protestant denomination, they believe in these things. They believe in the Trinity, one God, three persons. They believe in Christ's redemptive death, that by dying on the cross, he, um, he redeemed us. They believe that Christ was resurrected, that he died, uh, descended into hell, and was um, resurrected and eventually ascended into heaven. Uh, we believe all believe that Christ was both fully God and fully man, united in one person. We believe in the unity of the church. And this one, there's a bunch of caveats on, but at concept, we do all believe that there should be one Christian church. We all believe that the Bible is the word of God. This is one that will surprise some Protestants. But Catholics believe the Bible is the word of God. Uh, Protestants believe the Bible is the word of God. Orthodox believe the Bible is the word of God. We all believe in baptism, although, again, there's some different interpretations of what that means. And we all can profess, for the most part, the Nicene Creed. So there's a lot. 
that we share in common. And we should not forget these things. We should not minimize these things. We should not underestimate the importance of these things. And with that, I'm going to make a huge turn. And for the, for the bulk of the time here, I'm going to be talking about areas of disagreement. So most of what I'm going to be talking about is um, the majority of what are called the five solas. Uh, at the time of the Reformation, they developed some theories and that were uh, refined a little bit over the next century or two, but have generally been referred to the, as the five solas. And uh, I'm going to talk about four of them because the fifth one really isn't all that real as a disagreement goes. Uh, and these really are the underpinnings of everything else. So I will talk about each of the four of them. Um, and then I'm going to talk about one more, the issue of Christian unity. And then for each one of those, I'll talk about what some of the derivative topics are. What, because the Protestants have this different understanding, it has these implications of other things they look at differently. And I hope what that will do is show that a lot of what's going on here isn't sinister. These are legitimate disagreements. And some of these disagreements come from a place where they had a legitimate beef to start with. It doesn't mean that their conclusion was correct, but it does mean that how they arrived in that place was not um, full of malice. So let's start in. Sola Scriptura. I'm sure many of you have heard this. Sola Scriptura um, is the idea. It stands for the Bible alone. It means that the Bible is the sole authority for the faith. To quote Martin Luther, a simple arm, uh, layman armed with Scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. The idea is the pope doesn't mean anything. He doesn't have any teaching authority. Everybody can read the Bible for themselves with proper historical understandings and these kinds of things and authoritatively interpret uh, the church. This is uh, uh, and be authoritative interpreters within the church. And this was the result of the fact that the reformers saw a lot of corruption in the Middle Ages in the church, and they felt that this corruption was so pervasive, so much affecting the church that the church lost its authority. And so they went searching for some other authority. What can we rely on if the church has corrupted itself so massively? What can we look at as an alternative authority? And so they said, well, Scripture. Scripture doesn't change. Scripture has staying power. We can rely on Scripture. Um, and, and that's what they went to. There's obviously a significant problem with this way of thinking, unfortunately. Uh, as much as they would like to believe otherwise, it leaves the world open for hundreds of different interpretations. Scripture is an immensely complicated work. Nobody knows it in its totality. Nobody understands all of its nuance in a historical context. Not even the Pope, not even the wisest theologian at the greatest uni Catholic uni or Protestant or whatever university in the world. It is too massive. So it's just not possible to do it that way. And the reality is, from the very beginning, this was not the model. The model that Christ established, that is written in Scripture, is this idea of, no, I have the apostles, they are my delegates, and I commissioned them to be the church. And the apostles, when they were getting old, they commissioned new people to replace them. And on through the centuries it went. Every bishop in both the Orthodox and the Catholic Church can, at least in theory, obviously Poor records sometimes make it hard to figure it out. But, in pra but they can very definitively and with confidence believe that their ordination is traced back to one of the 12 apostles. One of the 12 apostles um, cons or, uh, or ordained a, a replacement, and they ordained somebody else, and they ordained somebody else, and they ordained somebody else, and they ordained somebody else. And you do that for 2,000 years, and you end up with Bishop Jaime Soto in Sacramento. And you also end up with Pope Francis in the Vatican. And so we argue that authority doesn't come from a book. It comes from Christ. And Christ gave that authority to the church. And in fact, the question, we, the answer we would give to the, well, what about the Bible is, well, how can you say that the Bible's authoritative? It's just a collection of writings. 
Who said that this collection of writings is the word of God? Who can authoritatively say that these writings are the word of God? And the answer to that question is, it was the church. The church in the 3rd and 4th century sat down and said, okay, we have all of these writings from Paul and Thomas and other people who claim to know what they're talking about. Which one of these are we going to bind together to be our new canon of Scripture? And they thought it through and they made their decision. A little quick aside, if you can't tell, I'm going pretty fast because I have a lot of content to cover tonight. But, you know, every year or two you'll hear some huge revelation of, oh, we just found the Gospel of Thomas or the, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. It's going to change everything. And I think to some degree it, this rattles a lot of Protestants or people who understand Scripture the way Protestants do a lot because they don't know how to deal with this. They don't know how to say it's bunk, it doesn't matter. But the Catholic answer is actually very simple. We say, you know what, you found this in some basement of some church or catacomb or something way at the bottom. And do you know why you found it in the basement? Because 1,700 years ago, when the church was deciding what documents were good, it looked at this one and said it's garbage, and they put it in the basement. Now, we're not opposed to the fact that you found it. It may t learn us to teach us a little bit about the heresies of the time and anything like that, and that's good history, that's good archaeology, that's interesting. But as far as it in any way challenging the nature of the church, we don't care. We rejected it centuries and centuries and centuries ago. We don't care. The authority comes from Christ who handed it to the church, and the church is the arbiter of what goes into the Bible. And therefore, of course, the church is also the, the arbiter of properly understanding Scripture. And yes, we do believe, and all Catholics and all Orthodox believe, it is the Word of God. And where does the authority come from to say that? It came from Christ handed to the apostles. So this is how we as Catholics look at it. But you have to be somewhat sympathetic. Think of it in a modern context. Think of it when you're looking at the U.S. government or whatever, the, your local school board or whatever, and you feel like they're just gone off the rails. They're full of corruption. They have problems. And so you're thinking, what else can I go to? What else can I look for as an authority besides this, these corrupt set of bozos? And so, of course, you start looking for something. So it's a very reasonable thing to want to do. There was real corruption in the church in this era. Uh, there's real corruption in the church today. It's just that the way they went about uh, addressing those issues ended up with a falsehood that doesn't stand up to scrutiny, at least from a Catholic perspective. Okay. Now, there's a, as I said, there are derivative disagreements that kind of start here, but then they, there's the implication, there's the dominoes falling behind that. Of course, one of these is just this whole idea of authority. Where's the authority? The authority is in Scripture. The, the story is in, if the authority is in Scripture, then it can't be in the church. And so they dismiss the authority of the Pope as part of that. Another is actually this idea of ordained ministers. Now, there's a number of Protestant denominations. This is not one that is so universal across Protestantism. But there's also, an, uh, so there are a number of denominations that do have ordained ministers, that do believe that there's some kind of authoritative body within their church communion, and they ordained through that. But there's actually a, 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 another portion of Protestantism that has generally rejected the idea of an ordained minister, um, particularly the idea of a priest, right? So if you hear these churches where everybody's pastor, Pastor, Pastor Bob, Pastor Joe, Pastor Mary, whatever, this is because they've more or less rejected the idea of, 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 of the ordained minister. And part of why they do that is because the authority doesn't come from a church. In the case of an authoritative church, we want to have those ministers. If you don't, you're less likely to. Uh, and so the idea of these ordained ministers is less common. An even bigger one that has definitely affected large portions of modern Protestantism, but not all, again, what I'll call the mainline Protestant denominations, which are, generally speaking, shrinking, uh, don't believe this, but the larger evangelical, the new churches, definitely at least uh, toy with fundamentalism and biblical literism, if not outright embrace it. 
They sometimes won't believe that that's what they're doing, but they are. Because the problem with Scripture is it is so rich in metaphor, so rich in symbolism, so rich in um, symbology, it, it can lead you lots of places. And so something that happened in the 19th century is lots of theologians in the Protestant world started going very, frankly, unreasonable places with their theology based on unique interpretations of various metaphors and symbology in the Bible. Fundamentalism was a reaction to that. No, no, no. Read the Bible literally. It means what it says. But that can get you into other kinds of trouble because there are times it is supposed to be a metaphor. It is supposed to be a, um, a, a, a symbology. It is not meant to be taken literally like the beginning of Genesis. Um, so um, and that's a whole different topic that we I can't get into in detail today. But nevertheless, um, fundamentalism and biblical literalism are kind of a result of sola scriptura because you need the Bible to be easily interpreted. And the only way to do that is to come up with a very literalistic uh, understanding of Scripture. Catholics, we aren't bound by that. Yes, it's the Word of God, but we are allowed to be more um, uh, uh, free to look at things at a metaphorical level because the authority of the church says, here are the bounds. Here's how far you can go in understanding these metaphors before you're bumping up against other concepts that aren't so negotiable. Okay, I did good to get through everything I wanted to get through before my intermission and only be uh, five minutes over. I'm happy with that. Reminders before intermission. First, I, I have another opportunity to ask questions right after intermission. So if you can get in any questions that you have now from the first half, do it before you go get your snack, because uh, you are 30 seconds to a minute behind me, and then it takes me 30 seconds to get your question. So if you get it in now, I'll have it by the end of the two-minute break. As a reminder, the easiest way to do this is be logged in on YouTube. If not, you can go to deaconken.org slash blog slash chat. And if none of that works, you can text 916-565-9005. And yes, we still have an intermission. Just a couple of minutes allows you to quickly go to the bathroom, get something to eat or drink, uh, and come back. So we will see you in two minutes and get those questions in.
Okay, we're back. Am I live now, Andrew? All right, I was muted there at first. Uh, <laughs> I'm back live. Uh, don't think any questions came in. There wasn't as of 30 seconds ago. Peter, anything new? Okay, definitely cue those questions up. Keep them coming. You can ask them at any time. Don't feel you need to wait for the intermissions. We may choose to hold them for the intermission uh, if it's something that, that you know is wise to do so. All right, let's get into the next topic on our list of topics of disagreement between Catholics and Protestants. Sola fide. Sola fide means faith alone. The concept here is that we are saved based on our faith, not our works. It's not about what we it's not about what we do, it's about what we believe. This is a react this one more than any of them is a very very specific reaction to a very very specific problem um, that existed within the church and it is one that the church recognized and responded to at the time unfortunately it was not enough to prevent the split at the time the church would do indulgences based on money and it would end up being kind of a building campaign thing, right? Of You'd have some guy, he wouldn't be the most moral guy, you'd have a church that needed built. And he'd say, you know what? If you want to get right with God, you know, you need to sacrifice. You need to give up something. So if you give some money to the church, uh, you know, you'll get an indulgence for that. Now, at a theoretical level, we, the church still thinks this is okay. When you do an act of penance, when you give something up, there can be a, a spiritual gift and blessing that goes along with that. And that includes financial. That includes sacrificially giving of your financial means, um, and not just to the church, to, to, you know, to the poor um, or to other good causes. So the church still stands behind the idea that anything sacrificial can have a spiritual benefit including money. However, the church does recognize that money is something where it's easy to be detached. It's easy for somebody who has a lot of it to not actually be making a sacrifice and be hoping that they're getting the spiritual benefits. And actually, the reality is they're probably not. They're probably not getting the spiritual benefits. So to some degree, you're even lying to them in thinking they would get the spiritual benefit. So it's an easy place for someone to say, I can pay to have my sins cleaned up. I don't really care about my sins, but the church tells me they are a sin, so I just hand them some money, and I can have a clean conscience. And obviously, that's not good. So the, the Protestant thought here was, wait a minute. We, you have to believe this stuff. You can't just be cynically giving money to the church or cynically doing some action. You have to really meaningfully have the faith. And in some sense, that is correct. But again, they overshot. What's the Catholic response to this? We believe we are saved by grace. It is the grace of God that saves us. And we have to cooperate with that grace. And we cooperate with that grace both through our actions and our faith. And we see it as the human person cannot be separated what they believe from what they do. These are too cohesively bound together to be separated the way sola fide would like to. Um, so in, our actions are an integral part of what we believe. We cannot make faith just ethereal, just something in our heads. And somewhat proof of this is what did Jesus do? Because uh, one of the things that is considered as a work is the sacraments. The sacraments are works. You go to be baptized, it is an action pouring water, and you receive a grace through that. And this is what Christ did. Christ did lots of physical things. There are some instances where he heals somebody from a distance. If you look at most of the stories in Scripture where there's the healing, he does some sort of physical thing to enact the healing. He doesn't take the blind man and just say, you are healed. No, he spits on clay and rubs it on his eyes. 
Did he need to do that from a healing perspective? I doubt it. I mean, I'm not Jesus. I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure he could have done it without it. But he's very in, Christ has always been incarnational in nature, and he's always doing his best to, um, uh, to operate things that way. So the Catholic perspective is we cannot separate these things, and we do receive grace through physical actions, through doing these things. And you should not separate actions from faith. They're integrally connected. But, as I said, we recognize that, yes, the money-based indulgences were fraught with abuse, fraught with, with um, corruption, and so therefore they were outlawed in the Council of Trent. We can no longer have an indulgence based on that. You can have an indulgence based on making a pilgrimage. You can have an indulgence based on praying some prayers but you cannot have one based on handing over money anymore. Now, again, like sola scriptura, there are these kind of derivative disagreements that come from this. As I mentioned, in particular, the sacraments. The sacraments are generally perceived as works. Now, most Protestant churches, if you've looked at that table very carefully, still do baptism. But depending on the particular church, their belief about how much that is that is a work and that how much that is tied to your salvation varies a great deal. They definitely believe it with things like the Eucharist and confirmation. In the Catholic Church, we believe we have three initiation sacraments and that Christ wants you to do th- all three of these if you want to be uh, initiated into the church. You're to be baptized, you're to eat his body and blood, and you're to receive the Holy Spirit, and that's what confirmation is. So that's why those are the three initiation sacraments. Uh, And you generally do not see an emphasis on that in most Protestant churches. Now, the Anglicans slash the Episcopalians, to some degree the Lutherans are a bit different, but um, most of, particularly American uh, Protestantism, has mostly detached itself from a sacramental view because those are works. You also see it in the culture and the behavior. We're the smells and bells church for a reason, because we really see faith through action. You have a prayer, you go light a candle, right? The Protestant general kind of response from a sola fide, say, why would you light a candle? That's an action. Just pray to God. Just pray. That's what you need to do. And we have a much more integrated mindset culturally. I don't know that this is as much of a theological problem as a cultural difference, difference. But it definitely exists. Part of the reason we're the Smells and Bells Church and you go to a Protestant church and it is very um, uh, devoid of these sorts of things is because of this mindset of our works and our actions being tied to our faith where the Protestant mindset is more of faith as a separate, more ethereal thing. And along those lines, this very incarnational view, uh, you know, that, that God works through creation for our salvation. Okay, now, two more of the the five solas. This is solus Christus and soli Dio Gloria. And these two are somewhat connected. So I'm going to uh, explain them both and then the Catholic reaction to them as as a group. Solus Christus. This is the idea of Christ alone. And what they mean is Christ is the only mediator between mankind and God. And this is one that does to some degree, at least is the why it happened in relation to the previous two items. They were looking at the church which which had set itself up as a mediator in a lot of these things. And they said, no, the church is too corrupt. It's to these things. The only mediator is Christ himself. And then they took that as well and the things we do with saints and Mary and all of this um, and, and said, no, 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 Christ alone. Again, this kind of very ethereal, just me and Jesus kind of mindset. Now, again, various Protestant denominations are not as strong in this as others, but you can see a lot of this in various areas. A very similar one is soli dio gloria. This is glory to God alone. And this means we shouldn't give any meaningful glory to lesser things, such as the church, 
or the Pope or Mary or the saints or any human being for that matter. So it's again this kind of thing that Jesus alone, God alone, all of these human institutions uh, related to God, no dice. Work directly with God is their way of looking at things. And interestingly, on this one, the Catholic Church would generally agree with Solus Christi, uh, Christus and uh, Deo, Deo Gloria. We do believe that Jesus is the sole mediator. We also believe that the church is his instrument. So when the church does it, it is Christ who's doing it. As an example, during Mass, when the Eucharist is consecrated, when the bread and wine become the body and blood, it's not the priest doing it, it's Christ doing it. The priest is in persona Christi. He is in the person of Christ, and Christ works through him. So we believe, again, in this very incarnational view of God's power working through the physical world. And therefore, yes, it is Jesus doing these things, but he's doing it through the church. He's doing it through other people. And it is important to remember that at the end of the day, it is Christ. So any excesses or misunderstandings where someone might think, no, um, uh, it is Mary or it is the Pope or it is the church, outside of Christ who's doing these things, that is an excess, and the church would agree with a Protestant perspective and say, no, it is Christ who's doing these things. The human aspects of it are just the instrument of Christ. And the same would go to glory, that we would say, yes, of course, God gets the ultimate glory, but we're willing to give lesser glory to lesser beings. So yes, the Pope gets a great deal of glory in the church, because he is an instrument of God. Mary gets a great deal of glory because she is an instrument of God. And in the end, where this is all coming from is God. So the glory goes to God, but at the simplest level, we're not afraid of the instruments of God getting some glory as long as the ultimate idea of God gets the ultimate glory is maintained. And so again, we do basically believe in principle these idea of Christus and... Um, Deo Gloria, but we just don't uh, take it down this road that Protestants take it down because of their anti, uh, their 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 concerns about corruption in the church have taken them down this road. We don't believe saints are mediators. To be really clear, we believe they are intercessors. If you look at the Hail Mary prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy, thy womb, Jesus. This is all just a statement of our faith of what we believe about Mary. It wasn't asking for anything. It was just saying, dude, Mary, you're pretty awesome. This is what's going to get me in trouble in heaven. I'm going to be at the gates of, uh, of, uh, with St. Peter there, and he's going to say, did you say, dude, Mary, you're pretty awesome? And that's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. All right, anyway. <laughs> um. Oh, I got stuck. Hail Mary. <laughs> That's the first half of the Hail Mary. But what's the second half of the Hail Mary? Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of the death. Hour of our death. So we're not asking Mary to heal us. We're not asking God to perform a miracle. We are asking God, we are asking Mary to intercede for us to God. Right? Uh Everyone knows the example of that person who's easily influenced by his mother. If you want him to do something, you get the mother to ask him, right? Um, or the wife or whatever. And this is kind of how we look at Mary. Mary knows Jesus, had him in, his, in her womb. Jesus loves her. If, you, if there's someone you want to ask a favor from Jesus from, you want Mary to be the one to ask it. And that's kind of our idea. That we do not think that she actually grants miracles. She is merely an intercessor that we can use but are not obligated to. So they are intercessors, not mediators. It's a big difference. Uh, but admittedly, this is where the Protestant disagreement is. They say, nope, God alone, straight to Jesus, no intermediaries, no other mediators. Some more derivative agreements associated to this. 
Again, this idea of ordained ministers, right? They would definitely look at that and say, again, this is a case. We're creating an, an, a, another mediator. The sacraments, again, these being some sort of mediation between Christ and salvation, where they would take it as a very, uh, again, ethereal connection. You've made your profession of faith. Particularly confession for this one. They look at confession and say, you can't ask a priest for forgiveness. You have to ask God for forgiveness. And this is another case where we say, no, 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 no. Yes, you're asking God for forgiveness, but the priest is acting in Christ's shoes. He's there for you as Christ's representative so that you can ask God for uh, forgiveness. And you can ask God for forgiveness in the flesh. Uh, and so this is why we would, we would believe that. But again, it's one where they say, no, you can't have anything like that, so we're not having confession. And then, of course, intercessory prayer to the saints, particularly Mary. Um, you'll see, actually, there's a, actually a great revulsion to Mary in a lot of Protestant churches, merely because of how much emphasis there is on her in the Catholic Church. And so they just very much pull away, even when at a theoretical um, level they should be okay with it, they still uh, are very kind of reticent to go down that road because they fear where it might go, I think. Okay, last major topic of disagreement, and then we're going to talk about um, you know, rules and ec ecumenism and things like that. The idea of spiritual unity as opposed to hierarchical or uh, uh, actual, you know, physical unity. And this comes down to the question of what is meant by one and Catholic in the creed? As I said at the beginning, Protestants agree with the creed. They can profess the creed. They may not do it regularly, but if you were to read them that text, they would agree. And you get to the line. We believe in one holy Catholic, small c Catholic, I'll explain that in a minute, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So what does it mean for it to be, I mean, everyone can be fine with holy, and most everyone can be fine with apostolic, that it came, comes through the apostles, you know, with some caveats of different interpretation. But the two ones that are really tough here are one and Catholic. Now, the word Catholic in Greek means universal, meaning it, it is worldwide, that it covers everything, that it is not localized. There's a universal church. And, of course, one means unified. But the Protestant understanding, again, that very much comes from this place. They saw so much corruption in the institutional hierarchical church they said that can't be it. And so they said unity instead will be a, a spiritual unity. It will not be an organizational unity, but a spiritual unity. And so that's what they look at. So they really, when Catholics look at splits between uh, Protestants, particularly when those splits are about style, we like rock music, you like um, contemporary, you like organs, we like drums, and so we're going to have separate services at separate places that do separate things. They don't see that the way we would, where that is a split of the church. They would look at that and say, no, we're still one church. We just have different styles of how we would like to worship God. And so we're going to do that. You're going to do that on B Street, and I'm going to do that on E Street, and we're still unified, one spiritual unified church. Um, and, of course, the Catholic view is a very different one. Uh, and, again, this comes from their anti-authoritative, anti-clerical mindset. If, they're, if they just can't buy into those things, they can't buy into the idea of an institutional, organized church. Um, one area where you see this, it's not even necessarily specific in Protestantism, but in the culture at large. This is the people who say, I'm spiritual but not religious. This idea that... I don't need a church. I don't need an organization. I don't need an institutional group. I just need to be close to God personally. I'm spiritual, not religious, is what they would say. And, of course, we would very much disagree with this. You need an organizational entity. Christ insisted on it when he started. He didn't just say, you random people who were listening to me, go figure it out. No, he picked 12 people, and he said, you're in charge. And those people continued that message on for not just centuries, but a millennia, and a millennia and a half before anybody else thought to say it's a spiritual unity. There's no mechanism to settle disagreements 
when you don't have some kind of organizational unity. Now, you can make significant arguments about what that organizational unity should look like. In fact, actually, a lot of the disagreements between Orthodox and Catholics comes down to precisely this issue. How do you come together for councils? Who gets to call them? What's the Pope's role in these things? This is where the Catholic Orthodox disagreements are. So there are legitimate understandings of what should this institutional organizational structure look like, but that is different than saying there shouldn't be one at all. Because if there isn't one at all at the end of the day, as we see in Protestantism, you end up with hugely divergent uh, way, uh, veins of thought because nobody's ever working on bringing them together. Nobody's saying, hey, wait a minute, we've got some diversion here. We need to, we need to decide what needs to be essential and what we must all agree on, and let's get in one room and figure that out. At the same time, and this is, again, something Protestants don't understand about Catholics, is we also believe in a big tent church. In a lot of ways, we are more open to a variety of theological interpretations than, an individual, than most individual Protestant churches are. They tend to have defined more things and said this is what is necessary. And we, because we are trying to keep together this huge coalition in an organized sense, often allow for a great more diversity. And this is why you see all of these movements and religious orders and, and various things inside the Catholic Church, like the Charismatic Movement, or just all the, the things that have happened over the centuries, the Franciscans and the Dominicans and the Jesuits and all of these groups. These were people who had a particular way of looking at the church, and they said, we want to go explore this, but we want to do it within the hierarchy of the church. And the church said, usually with some wrangling involved, but eventually said, yes, go do that. You can do that under the big umbrella Catholic. So it's not that we don't believe that there can be some diversity, but the diversity has to have some institutional hierarchical structure to it that is connected to the Pope, that's connected to the bishops, that ensures that nobody goes too far off the reservation. I didn't quite know where to put this one, so I put this derivative disagreement under the unity. And I do think it applies, but I must admit it's a little bit of a stretch. There are definitely Protestant churches. There's, again, a lot of mainline Protestant churches have joined us uh, in a liturgy that looks somewhat like ours. They use the same reading cycle that we do within reason. Um, but this idea of the liturgy, of the prayer of the church, and that it should have some form and function and consistency, I think, fits in this category. Um, and this is definitely something where Catholics look at the world a little bit different, particularly than the more loosely organized Protestants, which will have vastly different services. We Part of why we have such a structured Mass is because it's not the Mass is not just this one community. It is the prayer of the entire church that the Mass is this thing that is happening the entire world over, and it is a united people in worship and prayer with God. And that's what liturgy allows us to be. We're all doing it together. We're all saying the same words together. We're all studying the same Scripture together. It's a wonderful aspect of unity in a real sense. And so I think there's a connection between the idea of institutional organization and liturgy, even though you do see some Protestant groups who have bought into liturgy, somewhat like Catholics. Okay, now, there are plenty of other things I could have discussed, plenty of things that are yet further derivative ideas. I did not talk a lot about moral differences. That was an area I just couldn't figure out how to squeeze in without making this a two-hour talk. Because um, the reality is, in a lot of ways, morally, you'll see some consistency amongst Christianity. Um, <clears throat> it is not as consistent across various Protestant groups. You know, if you look at gay marriage as an example, yes, there are some Protestant churches that have started to adopt that, but the majority of American Christianity has not, uh, and that includes across various Protestant denominations. Um, uh, and, you know, there are some areas where the Catholics stand alone, uh, you know, or stand, are more likely to stand alone, 
birth control would be an example of that. Um, but as a general rule, it's a much more muddy water, and there are underpinnings like this that affect when there is more difference, but it's a lot harder to simplify it down. So for the most part, I ignored the moral stuff. Um, that's not to say that it's not real. I just didn't know how to fit it in a one-hour talk that I already went two minutes over. So let's get into rules and um, then finally ecumenism. Because there is a long history of disagreement and, and anger and wars and all kinds of things between Catholics and Protestants, there is a lot of people who think we are not supposed to in any way <laughs> you know, interact with, with them, that, that it's verboten and all of this. And I, I really want to emphasize this is not true. This is a misunderstanding. It may have been more true in the past, but in the modern church it is definitely not true. We are allowed to go to Protestant services of pretty much any type. We are not to receive communion because that would be endorsing or accepting their view of communion, which is different than our own. It would also, because we believe communion is not just about the bread and wine itself and what it becomes, but also a sign of our community, our unity as an institution, and we are not unified with them, we shouldn't be receiving it, even if we believe in similar ideas of what the Eucharist is. So no receiving communion but you can go. It also doesn't eliminate your Sunday obligation. So if you're going to go to a Protestant church every week because you love the music, as a Catholic, you're still bound to come to Mass every week. Um, so if that's what you want to do and go to both, I think you could do that. Um, it'd be a little bit odd, but it is allowed. Um, another rule that is true, and I talked about this in my talk about marriage, and this is why the church sticks to it, if you want to marry a Protestant, you do have to get a dispensation from the bishop. Now, it's a rubber-stamped thing. It's not hard to get at all, um, so it's not exactly a huge hurdle, but it is one. In fact, a lot of people who get married this way because the priest or the minister just takes care of it, um, uh, you know, they will, um, the, the couple doesn't even know it happened. It just, the dispensation was just signed. Now, Along those lines, this also means you pretty much need to have the marriage go through the Catholic Church because the Protestant minister is not going to give you that dispensation. So you have to go through the Catholic Church to get the dispensation. It is much harder to get a dispensation from the marriage ceremony being inside the Catholic Church, although it does occasionally happen. But at the simplest level, the marriage has to be presided over uh, in the Catholic Church uh, unless you get a second um, dispensation for that. So that's one that uh, actually I would say is more strict. The marriage needs to be, you need to get the dispensation, which is a rubber stamp, but then it needs to either be in the Catholic Church or you have to get the much harder dispensation for it to be elsewhere. Of course, uh, in this one people know, Protestants may not receive sacraments in the Catholic Church. The most obvious of this is, of course, the Eucharist. But there is an exception, marriage. You have to get a dispensation, but it, you can be sacramentally united uh, as a Catholic and a Protestant, um, and it is a valid sacrament that would apply to both of you. But they may participate in any Catholic event in Mass. They just can't receive communion. They can receive ashes on Ash Wednesday. They can dip their finger in the holy water and bless themselves. Um, they can do most everything except serve on the altar, right? That's supposed to be reserved for confirmed Catholics in good standing. But um, they're welcome at anything. They just can't receive the sacraments at those things. Uh, they would have to go through the proper preparation like a good Catholic would. And, of course, um, that preparation is something that kind of requires that you be Catholic to do. So the big point here is we're allowed to go to their services. They're allowed to go to our services. But when we, hit, when we reach the point of the sacraments, we have this divide between us, and each of us should be doing those things at our own churches or converting to the opposite one if you so feel. 
Uh, but we really do not have a lot of per- limits on participation. People, there are a lot of people who think Catholics should never go to a Protestant church. And I would say that's not true at all. Um, but you do need to understand what you're going to and that it is not the Mass and doesn't have those things and does not eliminate your requirements as a Catholic. I think actually a wonderful activity, if you have a, a couple or a family or something, you're trying to expose to Catholicism, a great mechanism. I know of at least two Catholics who, what we did is we said, I tell you what, one week we'll go to your church, we'll even go to yours first, and the next week you'll come to Mass. And it's amazing how many of them end up Catholic five to 30 years later. <laughs> So, my point is, yes, there are some rules that affect things like marriage, it affects the sacraments, but from a general uh, religious services perspective, uh, particularly an independent prayer service or something like that, there are not a lot of limitations. Which brings me to ecumenism. This got a, a, a jump start after World War II, and the Vatican II jumped it even further. The idea of ecumenism is, We have ignored for too long the lack of Christian unity, and it's time to start working on it. It's going to be a long, hard road. It is not going to be easy. But if we don't start working on it, the road's not going to get any easier ever. One of the Vatican II documents, Unitatis uh, Red... Oh, geez, I'm horrible with my Latin. Red Integratio was specifically about interrelations between Protestants uh, and, or excuse me, between Catholics and other Christians, and it has a large section on Protestants. It also has a large section on Orthodox. I want to read you a paragraph from that. <clears throat> it is allowable, indeed desirable, that Catholics should join in prayer with their separated brethren. Such prayers in common are certainly... <coughs> an effective means of attaining the grace of unity. And they are a true expression of the ties which still bind Catholics to their separated brethren. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That's from paragraph 8 of this document. See what it's saying here? See how it's saying that when two or three people are, are united in uh, Christ, even when you have a Lutheran, and a Greek Orthodox, and a Catholic, they are still united in Christ. What a wonderful sentiment. Now, are there theological differences that separate us? Are there <coughs> organizational problems that separate us? Absolutely. But unity must be our goal. We must be headed toward unity. And that requires reaching out in love without ignoring the doctrinal differences. We must treat them as siblings who we love. It doesn't mean they're doing everything right, but how would we treat siblings? With love. Okay, conclusion reminders. First, we'll have questions after I get through the conclusion slides. Can I get some water, please? So, uh, now is the time to get in your final questions. Excuse me. Now is your time to get in your final questions uh, before we get to the end. Because at the end, if I don't have any questions left, we're going to just move on uh, and have a final prayer. So, Final reminder, how to ask a question. Ideally, you're logged in on YouTube because you have a Gmail account or a Google account or YouTube account. If you don't have any of those, you can go to (coughs) deaconken.org (coughs) slash. Deaconken.org slash blog slash chat. And enter your question there. In both cases, all capitals, deacon question dash to let us know there's a question. Or you can text us at 916-565-9005. Sorry for not muting myself as I'm coughing away. <clears throat> Got a tickle in my throat. All right, conclusion. Protestants, of course, have significant differences from us Catholics. 
but we also share much in common. We should do our best to work with them to understand the history, understand the theology, and we need to work toward unity. And that should be our goal. It's important to understand these differences and not ignore them, but we need to figure it out. Okay, final few slides, uh, and then we will wrap up after questions. First of all, satisfaction survey. It's very important to me to get good feedback. This is something that has been languishing each um, uh, week over the summer. It's very important to me. I get feedback. So I'm really hoping now that we're monthly, now that we're not at the rapid-fire pace of the summer, people will be more committed to entering the satisfaction survey. So please, 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 it's, it was online as of 10 minutes ago. Um, let's uh, um, uh, <laughs> go to deaconken.org slash blog and get that figured out. Uh, you know, it's, I'm a little distracted because I still don't have my water. Um you go to deaconken.org slash blog. On there, the top post right now will be the satisfaction survey. Go fill it out. If it's not, you can select a category or you can go to this very long link to get to this one directly. Um, but please, uh, go ahead and um, uh, go ahead and uh, fill out a survey. It's very important to me. Um, it's the only way I can improve, is if you fill out the satisfaction survey. And I have improved a great deal because of honest, good feedback. Okay, next time. Next date, oh boy, I messed that up. The next time is not 8.13, it is 10.13, excuse me. 10.13 at 7 p.m., that's the second Tuesday in October. I just don't know how to write uh, see, oct is eight, and I, I got an excuse from a mathematical perspective. But nevertheless, we know October is ten. <clears throat> the topic is, how should I decide who to vote for? Um, I'm not going to be telling you who to vote for. I'm going to be telling you the process the church would suggest you should use to figure it out for yourself. Different people will come to different conclusions based on that, <clears throat> and so that's up to you. But my job is to help you understand church guidance on how you should figure it out. If you think that's an obvious answer one way, that doesn't mean I think it's that way. That doesn't mean somebody else thinks it's that way. I don't want you to uh, read into these things to think, well, Deacon Ken thinks X because of all the things he said. You don't know that. Different people come to different conclusions. But my job is to give you the tools of the church so you can make a good decision. November 11th, we'll be doing What is the Theology of the Body? December 9th, is there a conflict between faith and science? This is a talk I've done a few times, and um, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, well-received, very important. It's one of the few ones I didn't redo this summer, uh, but I am going to be redoing it in December, probably also connected to teaching it to the confirmation classes. A few other ideas we have for the future. How can I bring my adult children back to the church? Is it ever moral to go to war? Is the Bible the word of God? Uh, I have a couple others that I'm not sure if I'm going to squeeze in this year. But I'm definitely always looking for your suggestions. So either email me at ken at deaconken.org or go ahead and um, <clears throat> uh, put it as part of your satisfaction survey. Additional information, uh, here are some links you can use, deaconken.org, deaconken.org slash blog, or <clears throat> the new link I'm very happy about, youtube.com slash Deacon Ken Crawford. The capitals don't matter, it just makes it easier to read. Um, I finally got over the, uh, the 100 subscriber threshold, and that allowed me to have a custom URL. So you go to youtube.com slash Deacon Ken Crawford, and get to all of my content, web page. Email Ken at DeaconKen.org. Now, 100 was important, but 1,000 has some other important features. So, um, yes, 
Thank you to everyone who subscribed. Got me over the 100 limit. It's definitely got some features I really much like. But I would like to get to 1,000 someday. I know that's not going to come quickly. Maybe it's going to take a few years. But if every person who hears these talks, you know, every once in a while I pick up a new person, if you subscribe, it makes it more likely I can get to those additional features. Okay. On to questions. Peter, what do we have? No questions after all that time. Okay, well, then we will wrap up with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time this evening and for the many ways that you bless us. Help us to work on Christian unity, true Christian unity, not false unity where we ignore critical theological differences, but unity where we have truly united in one understanding of you and your teaching. Help us to constantly work towards that unity and treat our separated brethren as brothers and sisters in Christ, deserving of love, compassion, and dignity. We also pray for those who are suffering either from the pandemic or from the fires, whether that be through their work or direct impact. Give them comfort. Give them love. Help us to know how we can help them. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord and Savior. And I bless all of you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you and thank you for attending.